war. War can destroy lives, it can destroy cities, and it can destroy whole nations. But can it destroy a relationship? Let's find out. How's it going, Revision Squad? It's me, Liam, aka Mr. Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and today I'm back with another poetry analysis video. Now, today we're going to be looking at The Manhunt by Simon Armitage. It can be found on page four of the WJEC Edgecast Poetry Anthology. Before you get started with the video, I recommend that you grab at least three highlighters, uh, a pen, and some extra paper in case you run out of space for notes. This video is something of a soft reset of my poetry analysis videos. It'll be similar to the ones that I made previously, but there will be a few tweaks here and there. This is the first poem in the WJEC Edgecast anthology, and a similar video will soon follow for all the other poems. Click the link that I hope should be appearing uh, on screen up in the top corner about now to find a playlist of all of my analyses of the anthology poems. So in this video the poem will be read. I'll go through the poem's context since context is vital to your understanding of the poem and therefore your success in your exam. Relating analysis to context is equal to a third of the marks after all. I will provide a close reading of the poem. I'll analyse its imagery and its language and its structure, and I'll give you some uh, explained annotations too. But before I give you that, I will give you questions first, just in case you want to come up with your own interpretations. Now, I'll be honest with you, trying to answer the questions on your own first then looking at my ideas is how you're going to make the most out of this video. Showing a consideration of alternative interpretations of the same poem, the same quotation even, is a top grade skill. We will consider the poem's meaning, its mood and its motivation, and I'll explain what that means later on. But then we'll think about the themes it could relate to, and finally, at the end of the video, there will be an optional revision task for you to complete. Now, just to make sure that you don't miss out on a single one of these videos, please make sure that you drop it a like, and subscribe to my channel, Dystopia Junkie, and click the notification bell too. Cringeworthy self-promotion aside, it's time to read the poem. Make sure to follow along on your copy in your anthology. The Manhunt. After the first phase, after passionate nights and intimate days, only then would he let me trace the frozen river which ran through his face. Only then would he let me explore the blown hinge of his lower jaw and handle and hold the damaged porcelain collarbone, and mind and attend the fractured rudder of shoulder blade, and finger and thumb the parachute silk of his punctured lung. Only then could I bind the struts and climb the rungs of his broken ribs, and feel the hurt of his grazed heart. Skirting along, only then could I picture the scan, the foetus of metal beneath his chest where the bullet had finally come to rest. Then I widened the search, traced the scarring back to its source, to a sweating, unexploded mine, buried deep in his mind, around which every nerve in his body had tightened and closed. Then. And only then did I come close. 
So that's the poem. First, I think we should think about the poet, Simon Armitage. So Armitage is a poet who is alive and writing today. He is contemporary. He has received many prizes and accolades for his writing. In fact, he is the current Poet Laureate of the United Kingdom, which is a very high honour. It basically means that he's the UK's official poet, sort of. Now, Armitage wrote this poem for a documentary called Forgotten Heroes, The Not Dead, which is about various war veterans. This perhaps reflects his interest in the lives of everyday people, which we can assume because of his earlier career as a probation officer. Moving away from the poet and more towards the content of the poem, there are several other factors that are important for us to think about. Firstly, this is a poem about the effects of war. In this case, it's the Bosnian War, which was a violent war that lasted between 1992 and 1995 which broke out in Bosnia and Herzegovina after it had declared independence from Yugoslavia, which was a former country, a huge country in uh, southeastern and central Europe. As I've said, the Bosnian war was violent. Cities and towns were just shelled. Ethnic cleansing occurred and women were raped. So UN peacekeepers were sent to protect civilians. They uh, are trained soldiers, but as their name suggests, they were sent to keep peace. That meant they had to protect innocent civilians, guard borders and, and so on. They were not allowed to respond with violence, something that many peacekeepers found frustrating as it conflicted with their soldier training. Speaking of the peacekeepers, Eddie Beddoes was a British soldier who was brought in as a peacekeeper. Eddie, like many of his fellow peacekeepers, was injured and discharged during the Bosnian War. And like many of his colleagues, he suffered from PTSD, which is an anxiety disorder that is caused by frightening or distressing events. It can be characterized by nightmares and flashbacks, uh, feelings of isolation, irritability, guilt and depression. This poem is also sometimes called Laura's poem after Eddie's wife. This poem is told from Laura's perspective and it was her who read it out in the documentary. So before we look at the meat and bones of the poem, I think it's important to consider the poem's title. If you can analyse and gain meaning from a poem's title, that's excellent. In your exam, you will be given one poem in full, and you'll also be given a list of the titles of all of the other anthology poems. That means that immediately you have a quotation for the second poem that you'll write about in the comparison question. Also, poets choose titles for a reason, so they're not just random. Think about what a poet is trying to achieve or establish by giving a poem a certain title. As you can see on top of your screen, I've set up a quick key, and this key I'll be using throughout the rest of my annotations on this video. I suggest now is the time that you use to set up your key. You obviously don't need to use the same colours as me, but get three highlighters, set up a key, be consistent. When thinking about this title, there are two linguistic aspects that I would like to focus on. So first of all, I want to think about the word the. The is also known as the definite article, whereas a or an are examples of the indefinite article. This poem is called the manhunt, not a manhunt. So What's the effect of using a definite article? Secondly, I want you to think about the word manhunt. What could it imply? 
think about its meaning or its uh, connotations. If you want to answer these questions on your own first, I recommend pausing the video now. My ideas will appear in a moment, but engaging with the poem yourself and exposing yourself to multiple interpretations is something that will help you to achieve the top grades. So, I'd argue that the definite article is suggesting that the manhunt is incredibly important. Generally, when you use the definite article, you are suggesting that something is the most important or most valuable or the best. For example, a cat is one of millions or billions, whereas the cat, phew, the cat is the most significant cat of all. This manhunt may not be important to everyone, but it is important to the poem's persona, which is a fancy way of saying narrator. Using context, we know that the persona is Laura Beddoes, and we know that the poem is about Eddie Beddoes, and so their relationship and the strength of it is foregrounded in the poem's very first word. Secondly, the noun manhunt implies that someone has been lost. You cannot hunt for someone that you've never had in the first place. Therefore, it establishes that the poem will be about finding or reclaiming someone. Now, whether that's a, a literal reclamation or a metaphorical one is completely up to you to decide. It's worth saying now that there's no need to worry if your ideas were completely different to the ones I've come up with. Poetry is massively interpretive, and as long as you are sensible, it's very hard to be wrong. By sensible, I mean that as long as you consider the poem's context, it's hard to say something that sounds silly. I mean, OK, if you told me this poem is about dinosaurs, you'd probably be wrong. And it's, uh, it's quite hard to back that up. If you can back yourself up, I can't tell you that you're wrong. Here we have the poem's first three stanzas. And here we have the questions that I'm going to think about and answer in a moment. Of course, if you want to pause the video and have a go at making your own annotations based on these questions, now's a good time to do so. Doing so will, I believe at least, help you to write a more sophisticated analysis of the poem, which will help you to get a higher grade in your exam. So, a strong and loving relationship is suggested by the second line of the poem, especially as it encompasses both night and day. The love in the relationship is relentless. However, the time phrase after suggests that their loving reunion is short-lived, and so it's suggesting that some form of disruption lies ahead. The repetition of let me implies that Laura needs permission to look at and touch Eddie's injuries suggesting that there is a tension in their relationship and that normal loving activities are off limits or are faced with opposition and difficulty. At one level you could argue that the image Frozen River is symbolic of the scars and wounds in Eddie's face. You could look a little deeper though and argue that it could refer to his emotions. Maybe it's Eddie's emotions that are stuck in place as he battles with his PTSD. Blown Hinge is the first clearly violent image in the poem, suggesting fragility and damage and pain. It also emphasises how broken Eddie's experiences of war have left him. However, by only having this image appear in the third stanza rather than the first, it could suggest that Laura did not see, or she couldn't comprehend, the extent of Eddie's wounds.
at least to start with. The first three stanzas of this poem are all rhyming couplets, which are traditionally associated with love and love poetry. The rhymes contained therein are all very strong too. They're, they're full rhymes, phase days, trace face, explore jaw. Therefore, the use of rhyme could be indicative of the love that Laura and Eddie share and the strength of their relationship. The idea of rhyme uh, representing love or strength of love or strength of relationship is something that we're going to be revisiting throughout this poem. And now we have the poem's next three stanzas. For this section of the poem, I will be considering one, two, three, four different questions. Once again, if you want to pause the video and have a go at making your own annotations, now is a good time to pause and do so. We've got doubled verb constructions here, where each line, each top line of these stanzas has two verbs. Now, doubling up on those verbs creates a sense of care, especially when they are verbs that we would associate with being delicate and gentle. Handle, hold, mind, attend, finger, thumb. They're all quite soft, delicate, gentle actions in this context. Eddie's body has been compared to fragile or broken things. Porcelain, a fractured rudder, parachute silk. That emphasises how weak and broken his experiences of war has left him. The enjambment used in this part of the poem suggests that the healing process is slow and long, as the sentences and phrases seem elongated in comparison to the lines that contain them. On the other hand, caesura has been used to disrupt the rhythm and flow of these lines, indicating that there are barriers to the healing process. The healing process isn't necessarily straightforward or simple. Likewise, the weakening of the rhyme scheme could also symbolise the difficulty of the healing process or the difficulty Laura and Eddie are facing in their relationship. The rhyming couplets are gone. Hold and bone don't rhyme at all. There is weak consonants, uh, consonants being the repetition of consonant sounds, between attend and blade as the D sound is repeated. Thumb and lung almost rhyme, which we call half rhyme. The sense of love is weakening, therefore, perhaps as Laura and Eddie battle with his PTSD. The next two stanzas are relatively quick and easy, and as such, there's only one, two, three questions I'd like to consider. Pause now if you want to make your own annotations before seeing mine. Google tells me that struts are rods or, or bars that form a framework, uh, a framework that prevents something from collapsing in on itself. Binding means to set them in place securely. So if Laura is binding Eddie's struts, it suggests that she is putting him back together piece by piece. But in doing so, she's making him strong. Laura here is repairing Eddie. Next, we can see that Eddie's ribs have been compared to the rungs of a ladder. Much like climbing a ladder, especially a long one, can seem strenuous or daunting, so too is the mission of repairing Eddie. Also, Laura uses this ladder to reach Eddie's heart. This could suggest that only by attending to Eddie's physical wounds is Laura able to comprehend his emotional pain. Carrying on with that thought, the half rhyme could indicate that Laura and Eddie's relationship is strengthening once again, as she is beginning to understand both his physical and emotional trauma. So that half rhyme in hurt and heart. They don't fully rhyme, but they're almost there. The next two stanzas should be even quicker, because there's only two things that I'd like to consider here. The tone in the top line, and the extended metaphor that occurs across the stanza break. How might you answer these questions? 
pause now to give yourself time to come up with your own answers or carry on with the video to see my thoughts. Except you won't be getting the answers to those questions in this video. I've decided just to uh, cut the analysis there for now, just to avoid uh, creating too long a video for you. Um, but part two of the manhunt analysis will be coming very, very, very soon. I do promise you that. In fact, as soon as it's up, I will make sure to include a link to it up there. So if you have found this video useful or helpful or interesting, then please give this video a like, subscribe to my channel Dystopia Junkie, and use the comment section as well if you uh, want to ask me a question or if you uh, want to add your own analysis. Thank you for watching, have an amazing rest of the day, and I'll catch you very soon. Cheers.